And um, as I mentioned, I, uh, I'm trained as a geographer, and as a geographer, it gives me extreme pleasure to introduce to you uh, one of the ultimate geographers, I would say, uh, Sir Gordon Conway, um, and uh, the man who, who, at least for us, doesn't need an, an introduction. Um, Gordon, um, uh, let us hear what you want to say to us, and I'm sure you do that from a, a, an integrated perspective in which geographers are so strong. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. That's a big challenge. Um, I'm delighted to be back here in Brussels, and I, I uh, congratulate uh, Isolina Botto for um, persisting in getting me to come here. Uh, it's good to be among friends of many kinds, and also new people who I've uh, only just had acquaintance with this, this breakfast time. Um, I, uh, the, it's the right hand, no, it's, it's this one, sorry. No, yeah, okay, I'll turn that off. Uh, irrigation, uh, Dr. Oderok, Adarekio has given a, a wonderful conspectus of the whole range of land, water, uh, and energy nexus. I'm going to only take part of this and come at the water demand and, and supply component, particularly in Africa. Uh, first of all, we need to realize that the amount of irrigation in Africa is very small. Uh, gone the wrong way. Higher yields depend crucially on irrigation in Africa. There's plenty of water in Africa, but it has to be harnessed. And it can be used on a large or small scale. And we have to make decisions about that according to the circumstances. It has to be smart. It has to be ingenious. And it means it has to be used precisely and sustainably with resilience. And that is what uh, Dr. Alderico was talking about in terms of sustainable intensification, which I am a great fan of, although I'm not going to talk much about it in detail today. There is plenty of water in Africa. Plenty of water in Africa. These are, you can't see these up close, but these are all the great watersheds, all the great rivers, uh, the Nile, Limpopo, uh, are, are, are just some of them, uh, the Congo, of course. Huge amounts of water in Africa. In the Congo, it, it rains 365 days a year. But the uptake of irrigation in Africa is very small. Just look at that map. You can see uh, the Congo again is virtually no irrigation at all. There is some irrigation in, uh, in the north, in, uh, along the Nile, uh, and in the Sudan, and some elsewhere. But it's only 6% of all Africa's arable land is irrigated, and only 4% is irrigated in sub-Saharan Africa. And we also know that climate change is going to have a serious impact on agricultural production in Africa. And you can see the figures up there, the projections of declining yields as a result of climate change. So in Africa, we need more water just to stay put, let alone to increase production. The benefits of irrigation are considerable. They're not really in doubt. We know you can increase productivity with irrigation. Everybody knows that if you give plants water, even those who are just gardeners here in Brussels know <laughs> that if you give plant water, it grows better. If you don't give it any water, it dies. It's quite straightforward. We all know that. We also know that water is important 
for women's empowerment. On the one hand, if you don't have easy water available, it produces enormous drudgery in the work of women. But we also know that women can be great uh, exploiters of water. Uh, I was in uh, Senegal recently up in the north along that great river that runs between Senegal and Mauritania, which they've now developed for agriculture in a big way. And I was, one of the groups I went to see was a women's cooperative. And uh, the women were all standing there talking to me and they were, they switched on the machine uh, that they'd leased and the machine was producing the rice at the far end and they took the rice and they put it in bags and they stamped it with a picture on the bag. And the picture was of the woman who was the head of the cooperative and so it was called uh, Mother Rice after her. And it went into bags and the bags then went into trucks that went to a particular neighborhood in Dakar. In other words, they had this link between Dakar and what was happening there in the Northeast. What is remarkable is that Senegal is now something like 80% self-sufficient in rice production, whereas it used to import all its rice from India and, and, and elsewhere. And I've already talked about the climate risk for irrigation. But finally, we need to talk about job creation. Those cooperatives were creating jobs that I talked about. There's enormous potential to increase agricultural employment through irrigation. And we need to keep bearing that in mind. Uh, this diagram is a little bit um, busy, I'm afraid. Um, I've already talked about the low level of irrigation in Africa. The estimate is that we could go to some 38 million hectares from the current 7.7 .7 million hectares of irrigation. That's all feasible. Uh, and that is important to recognize. There are only a small number of countries at the moment with a lot of irrigation. I can't read them here, even there's about five countries there, uh, Egypt, um, Egypt, the Sahara, um, even my eyesight. Sudan, South Africa, uh, Morocco, and Ah, better eyesight there. <laughs> so th there's only those countries that have got much irrigation, and the rest of Africa could easily adopt a great deal more. There are opportunities in small-scale irrigation, which are, of course, labor-heavy, but not necessarily uh, overbearing. There's ways in which you can produce irrigation on a small scale, which can be done without a great deal of labor, but you have to be efficient about it. There's also large-scale irrigation. And of course, we have to recognize that large-scale irrigation has got a bad name because of failures in Southeast Asia and elsewhere in the world. Large-scale irrigation is out of favor now. I remember when I was working in, uh, in, in Thailand and, and elsewhere, there was major investment going on in irrigation. A lot of it was really very uh, well organized. I remember in northern Thailand, the, um, the government put in a new irrigation system. But the water was only brought to the edge of the traditional village irrigation system. That was very important. So the villagers had control over the water that they received. And that was a good, sustainable system of irrigation with the community heavily involved. And we need those kind of systems in Africa. But unfortunately, there's not a lot of investment in irrigation going on now because it's believed that irrigation is always destructive of, of the environment in one way or another. And there are 
are, however, a lot of innovative techniques. You can see them up there. Uh, drip irrigation, center pivot irrigation, floppy sprinklers. I'm not quite sure what a floppy sprinkler is, but um, I shall find that out. Somebody will tell me what a floppy sprinkler is. Uh, soil sensors, hyperspectral cameras, and so on. Uh, these are all in the report that we have just recently produced on irrigation. So there's a lot of potential technologies, a lot of potential uh, application of irrigation around the world. But there are considerable barriers in terms of infrastructure, um, skills development, land tenure, access to finance. One of the most important is access to finance. This, of course, is true throughout Africa. African governments, by and large, are not very good at accessing finance. It's got better. Uh, you find that the Chinese are very good at accessing international finance. Uh, they ha they know, have bureaucracies in their governments who know how to write all the proposals and to get the money that they need. Uh, and this is a, a real problem in Africa. Uh, you can see one of the one way of getting the money is through public-private partnerships. Uh, the Green Climate Fund uh, has a great deal of money, and there are some uh, applications of it, but certainly not enough. Uh, and trying to unleash all that money in uh, in Africa, I think, is a, a goal that's well worth pursuing. Um, We've also looked at a number of examples of irrigation in different countries. So, for example, and we've got about, in our report, we've got about seven or eight countries that we've looked at. Uh, one is uh, small-scale irrigation success in Niger, uh, coming about because of this accelerated development and poverty reduction strategy, and another strategy of small irrigation in 2015. So it, it's important that countries have these well-developed strategies. But what I really want to talk about is what's happening in Ethiopia. Uh, some of you may remember that we had an earlier report on nutrition. And we discovered I'll tell, tell a quick story here. Uh, we were planning our work in Berlin, and Agnes Kalabata was across the table from me, and I said to Agnes, you've got 40% stunting in, in Rwanda. What are you doing about it? And Agnes turned around to me and said, that's not true, she said. It's only 22%, and we are doing a great deal. I said, well, what are you doing? She said, we are getting the government departments of all the different ministries to work together and they work together in a way that reports direct to the president of Rwanda and that's the way you get change and we then promoted that and many other countries adopted it around nutrition and the same applies here for uh, water and other aspects. You'll see we have something called the Agricultural Transformation Agency set up in, uh, in Ethiopia, um, I think it must be about five years ago or more. About 10 years ago. Hmm? Well, about 10 years ago. Now, I remember it being set up. I thought, I, I thought it was not so long ago. But this is a really important agency because you see it brings together the ministries of finance the ministry of environment ministry of agriculture and the ministry of water irrigation and electricity and the transformation agency is chaired by the prime minister that's what's crucial about something like this if you just have cross committees and so on and nobody in charge who really has got power nothing happens it was one of, it's one of the great lessons that we've learned more recently. You can be very good at technology, and I'm a technologist, but in the end, what changes the world is the organizational uh, 
aspect. And this is a very good example uh, of institutional innovation. Uh, we have talked about a whole range of smart irrigation strategies, and they, of course, need uh, funding. And my last slide here is just to illustrate the work. The Malibu Montpellier panel has been in existence now for uh, five years or so. I created the Montpellier panel 10 years ago uh, called Montpellier because we met in Montpellier, not for any other reason. Uh, but I love Montpellier anyway. <laughs> and um, we, uh, we created the panel then. And its, its purpose was to try and persuade European donors to do a better job of supporting agriculture in Africa. And that's when I used to come a lot to the European Union, because I regarded you as a big donor. And uh, we talked to other donors, too. And then we transformed it into the Malibu Montpellier panel uh, to have a much more African focus. And so uh, Usman Bajan in, in, in Senegal is one of the chairs, and, and Joachim von Braun is another chair. And the members of the panel are nearly all African. There's, there's only a few that are not. And it really focuses on persuading African governments to do a better job of supporting agriculture. And part of that is persuading African ag agriculture, uh, other ministers, to do a better job of supporting irrigation. Um, the WaterWise is the report on irrigation. There's a few copies outside, but you can download it just by going to uh, mamopanel.org. Um, and the latest report came out only last week uh, called Bite by Bite, which is the complement to your uh, irrigation, uh, to your to your to your digitalization report. And I'm delighted that that's come out. Unfortunately, I don't have any hard copies here, but you can download them <laughs> as well. Thank you very much. Many thanks, uh, Gordon, and. Uh, We'll, uh, we'll certainly look again at your reports and, uh, and see how, uh, how we can take the recommendations uh, forward also in the European Commission.